Hello students and welcome to Grade Up. My name is Saurabh Day and we are here to check out the first part of UGC NET Paper 1 held on 6th of December morning session for English. So guys, I hope that uh, many of you are going to benefit a lot from this particular session. So let's start the session. Okay guys, now as far as the first question is concerned, so here it is. Now, in which of the following essays did Charles Lamb first use the pseudonym or persona Elia? First play, my first play, The Two Races of Men, New Year's Eve or The South Sea House. So guys, what do you say? What is the correct answer as per your uh, opinion? Well, in reality, the correct answer is going to be option 4 that is the South Sea House. So my dear friends, the correct answer is option 4, the South Sea House. So that what we can say is, is this option D4 is the correct answer. Well, let's have some more information about this. So Essays of Ilya is a collection of uh, essays written by Charles Lamb. It was first published in a book form in 1823 with the second volume, Last Essays of Ilya, issued in 1833 by the publisher Edward Moxon. Charles first used the pseudonym Elia for an essay on the South, on the South Sea House where he had worked decades earlier. Elia was the last name of an Italian man who worked there at the same time as Charles and after that essay, the name stuck. And by the way, students, my first play, The Two Races of Men and New Year's Eve were also composed by Charles Lamb. So I hope we had some useful information over here. Now let's go forward. So here's question number two for all of you guys. Now, which of the following is the proper explanation of the concept of Freytag's pyramid? Well, your options are analysis of the plot of a drama, analysis of the characters of a drama, analysis of the theme of conflict between a woman and two men in drama, or the analysis of different types of drama. So what do you say guys? What's the answer? Your time starts now. Well, let's take a look at the answer and the answer is it's option one or rather what we can say option A number one, analysis of the plot of a drama. Let's look at this pyramid. What was this pyramid about? So here's an explanation of the same. First there's exposition, then we have got the rising action, then we have a climax, then we have a falling action and finally we have got the denouement. Okay, so see the point is guys that first of all as far as exposition is concerned, so in exposition we have got the protagonist, we have got the antagonist, alright, and uh, actors there, the primary, you know, the primary hero is there, then the heroine is also there, alright. So anyway, so the protagonists are there and then we also realize what is the conflict over here. Okay, so between the antagonist and the protagonist, what is the conflict? Okay, so such things are introduced in this particular scenario. Then when it comes to the rising action, you know, this conflict between the protagonist and the antagonist keeps on rising. And in fact, some uh, secondary characters which support the antagonist or the protagonist also enter. And uh, primarily, in uh, if it's a tragedy, you know, these secondary, uh, what do you say, characters from the side of the antagonist, they try to harm or they try to, uh, you know, uh, make more of an issue for the protagonist, all right? then moving towards the climax part. So when we have reached the climax, then this is the highest point of conflict between the protagonist and the antagonist. Now after the climax, you know, when we come down towards the falling action, so when you're in the falling action, the aftermath of the climax has already started. The primary conflict is over. Now the conflicts are slowing down. In fact, there might be a position of compromise between the protagonist and the antagonist and finally Here's the last stage. Now, when it comes to the last stage, so perhaps it's uh, generally, if it's not a tragedy, if it's a comedy, it's going to be a happy ending for the characters. And if it's a tragedy, then perhaps our protagonist is doomed. Okay, guys. Now, I hope you got the point. What about, uh, what are the main parts of this pyramid? So, let's go forward then. Okay, so here's the next one, guys. Now, what does Socrates mean when in Plato's Ian he says, Poets are nothing but the interpreters of God? Your options are the poets are the markers of their poems. The poets are actually aware of God in composing their poems. 
The poets are divinely possessed when they compose their poems. The poets first hear what God say and then put that into words. So these are your options, my dear friends. What do you think is the correct answer? Well, guys, in reality, it is going to be a very important one. This uh, possession plays a very important part and it's going to be the poets are divinely possessed when they compose their poems. Now, some of you may be surprised. How is this possible? Well, let's look at the part or look, let's look at the words that Socrates used in this conversation. So, during the conversation with Ian and Socrates, uh, what exactly Socrates said in this particular special creation by Plato, the words of Socrates were, the poets are only the interpreters of gods by whom they are severely possessed. Was not this the lesson which the God intended to teach when by the mouth of the worst of the poets, he sang the best of the songs. So basically, uh, it's more like, you know, Dhinchak Puja singing like Lata Mangeshwar. So that is what, this, if this can happen, that can only happen because a Dhinchak Puja gets possessed by the God. So this is what Socrates wanted to convey. Okay, guys, now let's check out the next one. So I hope you got the point of the first three questions. Here's the next one, number four. So examples of poetic compounding are found in the work of which two modern, modernist writers? All right, this is a very interesting question, my dear friends. Well, your options are Graham Greene or James Joyce or Gerard Manley Hopkins or Stephen Spender. So guys, what do you say is the correct answer? Uh, is it C and D? Is it A and B? Is it B and C? Or is it A and C? Well, my dear friends, the answer is... All right. So let's take out the answer. The answer is going to be option C. That is James Joyce and Gerard Manley Hopkins. Well, what do you say? What do we know about compounding? Well, as far as compounding is concerned, Old English poetry makes extensive use of compounding. The combining of two words to make a new word. An example is P sick. Now, that actually literally means life sick. Okay, which can be translated as mortally wounded. Somebody who is so heavily wounded that he's going to die. All right. So for a person like that, we can say, uh, or rather the others used to say of the old times of the old English poetry, the poets used to say that, you know, okay, so this guy is life sick and he's certainly going to die. All right. So a more common uh, example can be found in the first line of Beowulf, Gardena, literally means spare Danes, all right, where Gard stands for spare and Dena stands for, uh, stands for Danes. Compounding, by the way, uh, may be done to meet the needs of the alterative meter as part of a formula or to make a new word. So this is compounding as far as this is concerned. Now, let's check out the next one, guys. Here's the next question. So here's number five, guys, which of which three of the following poets figure in William Dunbar's Lament for the Makers? Well, your options are Geoffrey Chaucer, John Gower, Robert Henderson, or William Langland. So guys, what do you say? What is the answer? A, B, and D, A, B, and C, B, C, and D, or A, C, and D. Well, my dear friends, I see no reason to answer anything except Geoffrey Chaucer, John Gower and Robert Henderson. Now, if you know about this lament for the, actually it, is, it was lament for the Macaris, not makers, it's going to be Macaris, that's a misprint over there. So anyway, let's check out, uh, let's check out more about this. So I, uh, I that in heel, west and gladness is also called as the lament for the Macaris. And by the way, it's a poem in the form of a dance macabre by the Scottish poet William Dunbar. Every fourth line remorsely, that means sadly, repeats the latent refrain, Timor mortis contubate me. That is, fear of death disturbs me or troubles me. A, lit a litanic phrase from the office of the dead. So I hope guys, uh, you would have got a background of these questions by now and uh, you would have been able to understand all the special information that we are sharing with you. Well, let's check out the next session, next question actually that we have for you. Now, who among the following has written a series of poems entitled Very Indian Poems in Indian English? Well, was it Vikram Seth? Was it Arun Kolatkar? Was it Nisim Ezekiel? Or was it Keki and Daruwala? 
So what do you say guys? What's the answer over here? Well guys, the answer, the answer is option 3 that is option C, uh, number 3, Nisim Ezekiel. Well, let's check out the information that we have over here. Now, Nazim Ezekiel is one of those Indian poets writing in English, writing in fact uh, in Indian English perhaps, uh, who creates an authentic flavor of India absolutely by using Indian English, Pidgin English or Bazaar English as it is often called in general. In this poem, the Indian flavor has been created by stressing the various mistakes which Indians commit in their use of English, by bringing in the hopes and aspirations of free India and also the attitudes of her two hostile neighbors, China and Pakistan. So I hope guys that uh, you had a nice background check of Nisim Ezekiel. Well, let's check out the next question then. So here it is, which of the following is the correct chronological order of publication of the following poems. Number one, Lamia, Paradise Lost, Elaster, the Dunciad or number two, the Dunciad, then Elaster, then Lamia, then Paradise Lost or Elaster, then the Dunciad, then Paradise Lost and then Lamia or Paradise Lost, then the Dunciad, then Elaster and then Lamia. So what do you say guys, what is the correct answer? Well, my dear friends, as far as the answer is concerned, it can be nothing except Paradise Lost, then the Dunciad, then Alastair, then Lamia. Well, why is that? Let's take a look at the publication years of these particular uh, creations. All right. So the correct chronology of publication, Paradise Lost by John Milton in 1667, then the Dunciad by Alexander Pope published in 1728, Alastair or The Spirit of Solitude by Percy by C. Shelley published in 1816, then Lamia by John Keats published in 1820. So I hope guys that uh, the order of publication or the chronology of publication of these creations are clear to all of you. Let's go forward then. What is the order of publication of the books of Neom Chomsky? So, uh, an interesting uh, person this, Neom Chomsky. Well, let's check out uh, the options that we have here. Problems of knowledge and freedom, aspects of theory of syntax, synt syntactic structures, knowledge of languages. So, what do you say guys? Is it number one, number two, number three or number four? What is the correct chronology of publication? Well, let's check out the answer guys and it had to be option three that is First C, which is your syntactic structures, followed by B, which is aspects of the theory of syntax, followed by A, which is problems of knowledge and freedom, followed by option D, which is knowledge of language. Now, let's check out the years of these creations, publications, when these creations got published of Neom Chomsky. Well, first of all, came the syntactic structures in 1957, followed by the aspects of Theory of syntax in 1965, then problems and freedoms was delivered, problems of knowledge and freedoms was delivered by the way in a way of lecture in 1971, then knowledge of language was published in 1986. So I hope guys that the years are uh, clear to all of you. Let's check out the next one then. How many tales and pilgrims are there in Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales? Is it 24 pilgrims and 23 tales? Is it 23 pilgrims and 24 tales? Is it 22 pilgrims and 24 tales? Or is it 24 pilgrims and 22 tales? So what do you say guys? What is the correct answer over here? Well guys, uh, I hate to admit, but this question is wrong. The reason why? Because all of these options are actually incorrect. In Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, reality, in reality, there were 29 pilgrims, neither 24, nor 23, nor 22. There were 29 pilgrims and 22 tales. Okay, guys. So that's why that was the correct answer. Though, uh, as far as this question is concerned, if you get questions like this, I'll, uh, I think you should certainly, at, at, you know, you should certainly attempt them because ultimately the board is going to realize that this is the question is wrong and ultimately you'll get a mark. Okay. So that's why. But anyway, the correct answer over here is 29 pilgrims and 22 tales. However, since the uh, options were wrong, the answer is not available in the answer keys. Well, let's check out the next one then. The last question of our today's part. 
given below are two statements assertion and reason so let's check them out the assertion is many modern british writers infuse their works with an extreme sense of uncertainty disillusionment and despair reason the wasteland ends in a flurry of random allusions now in the light of the above two statements choose the correct option both a and r are true and r is the correct explanation of a both a and r are true but r is not the correct explanation of a a is true but r is false a is false but r is true so what do you say guys what is the correct answer well my dear friends in reality both a and r are true but r is not the correct explanation of a now i know my dear friends uh you had a good practice you certainly would have had a good time we hope for the same now the thing is guys that uh, this is the first time perhaps that uh, you will be checking out my lecture there are more parts coming in reality we have planned at least a series of five parts this is just the first part you know and i hope that you were able to understand the importance of the questions i hope you were able to uh, grasp the extra information given along with the questions of this of this particular in this particular uh, what do you say lecture in this particular video the thing is guys that at grade up we are always working to make sure that you know how uh, close can you get to your goal and how quickly or how uh, what do you say how nicely perhaps you can achieve your goal and that's why our tagline very clearly states prep smart go better go grade up so this is sort of this signing off i hope you had a good time i certainly did and peace out my dear friends